All right, folks, we're down to our final speaker today, Monica Miller. Monica is the legal director and senior counsel of the American Humanist Association at Pignani Humanist Legal Center. She's also the executive director of the Humanist Legal Society. Since 2012, Monica has vigorously defended the constitutional mandate of separation of church and state. She's litigated cases across the country as, as lead counsel in over 25 federal cases, including one before the Supreme Court. You've probably seen her on Fox News and MSNBC, heard her on NPR, or even read her quotes in USA Today, the New York Post, or I'm sorry, the New York Times, as well as the Washington Post. Monica Miller is also an attorney for the Non-Human Rights Project, working to obtain common law personhood rights for non-human animals, with her work featured in the HBO documentary, Unlocking the Cage. Let's all welcome Monica Miller. Thanks for sticking around <laughs> till the end. Um, I think I'm going to talk today about the, the Supreme Court case because that is the most recent um, big case that we had and it is one that is pretty scary um, if you know the outcome. Um, just a show of hands, how many people have heard of the Bladensburg cross case or the Supreme Court's cross case? Yeah. Um, it was pretty gut-wrenching when the Supreme Court decided to take this case. And since some of you haven't heard of it, I'll just give a little background. Um, we filed a lawsuit against a government in Maryland because they had been maintaining and paying for and displaying a 40-foot tall Latin cross in the middle of the, one of the busiest intersections in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, we found out that they were actually had paid about like $125,000 because it had been crumbling and they kept repairing it and it kept crumbling again. So this is a lot of taxpayer dollars going into a monument. Usually we're talking like $1,000 to put up a nativity scene and, you know, maintain it. But this is a big expend uh, government expenditure. Um, so we find out that there's this giant cross in a median. Um, I surveyed the case law and found out that it the courts have been basically unanimous that you cannot, um, a government cannot maintain the quintessential symbol of Christianity on government property, even if it's a war memorial, which this was. Um, you wouldn't know it's a war memorial on its face because the only physical indication of its war memorial status was a plaque on its base that had been obscured by bushes for decades. Um, and yes, they would hold annual events at the cross, but because it's a median in a very busy intersection, um, you can't actually traverse uh, the intersection safely and I've tried to do it and it's pretty terrifying um, so once you get over there that's kind of the only way you know it's a, a war memorial is going up and seeing it but besides the point it, the reason why the courts have come down on saying even war memorial crosses are unconstitutional and some have gone so far as to say that that makes it worse is because the government can't single out Christians for special treatment. Um, you know, there are atheists in foxholes. There were plenty of Jews that fought in World War I. There were plenty of Jews in Maryland at the time, and this was a World War I memorial, that had fought in the war that weren't being honored by a large Latin cross. It seems kind of obvious. Um, it gives the impression the government favors Christian soldiers over non-Christian soldiers, or it gives the impression that Christianity and patriotism are one and the same. Either way, it's a huge problem. Um, so we filed this lawsuit. We actually lost in the district court, which was kind of alarming because we were in Maryland district court. It's not like Alabama. Um, and the court just kind of found some weird convoluted way of basically saying the cross wasn't religious. But I was like, no problem. Take it up to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a historically conservative um, court. But I felt like the law is on our side. We will win this case. And we did. Um, the court said, the government cannot maintain a large Latin cross on government property because it gives the impression, if one is aware that it's a monument or memorial to begin with, it gives the impression that Christian veterans are preferred. And if they don't know that it's a war memorial, it just looks like Bladensburg is the, the, the Christian county. When you come in, that's the first thing you see when you enter Bladensburg is a giant 40-foot cross. So found it unconstitutional. Um, our opponents, which were the um, Maryland local government that maintained this monument, and then the American Legion, which had intervened, um, and they in turn hired Liberty Council, uh, First Liberty uh, is now what they're called, very you know Christian um, legal group, and um, they filed uh, a petition for the entire Fourth Circuit to rehear the case, and they lost. So I was like. Good, we, we won our case. The odds of the Supreme Court at that juncture taking our case up would have been nil because the courts, the only, one of the main reasons the Supreme Court would get involved 
is to resolve some sort of conflict between the courts. And this was an instance where the courts had, like I said, been unanimous in finding government crosses unconstitutional. It's not a gray area. It's not a Ten Commandments. It's not a nativity. It is a giant cross. So they filed a petition for certiori, two petitions actually, because the government filed one and the American Legion filed a separate one. So I had to respond to both of those in the same time that I would have to respond to one. So I was very busy just opposing those uh, petitions. And the court kept putting it off its docket. They'd say, we're going to decide it next week and next week. And it got bumped off the like to the next week a lot of times, like more than was normal, because I asked um, uh, SCOTUS blog because they track these things and I was like is this normal for something to get bumped this much like are they continuing to discuss this and this is pre Kavanaugh and they're like yeah this does seem a little weird that how much they're they're bumping this and this is during now the Kavanaugh hearings um, so Kavanaugh gets confirmed and then they took the case and they need four justices to take a Supreme Court case they don't need a five majority so I have a suspicion he was their fourth vote um, regardless they took the case and we were kind of like, that's not good. Because you know when the Supreme Court takes your case, it, it, not that we filed, but that took the opponent's case, that we're not gonna win this thing. Um, so I spent the next four months not only drafting the merits briefs, but trying to figure out a strategy to make sure that we do the least amount of damage. Knowing the court's gonna rule against us, how can we prevent the court from, from issuing a ruling that's gonna affect a ton of cases down the road? Um, our opponents were arguing two things, one, that the cross is not religious and or it's not Christian rather it symbolizes atheism Judaism you know it's it represents all of the soldiers um, from World War one that was the government's argument um, they said you know you don't need to overrule existing precedent they were kind of taking a middle stance don't overrule existing precedent just find sort of a sham way to uphold this thing it's not religious um, the American Legion opponents on the other hand acknowledge its religious character and said who cares we are a Christian nation. We, you know, our understanding of separation of church and state is wrong. We should go back to the time of the founders. Um, we should, you know, acknowledge our Christian heritage and blah, 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 blah. They basically wanted the court to overrule separation of church and state as we know it. So that was my concern. It wasn't the government's argument that the cross isn't religious because that's just ridiculous. That's ludicrous. Of course it's religious. It's the Christian symbol. And for that reason, our side actually had Christians writing amicus briefs for us, um, the, the Baptist Joint Committee, uh, Methodists, Protestants, we had a ton of religious groups that said, we don't want the government co-opting our most sacred symbol and cheapening it and degrading it and changing its meaning and saying that it represents atheists because it doesn't. So that was offensive to them. So this was one of those weird situations where our normal opponents were actually our allies and that was fantastic to get to work with them. Um, so the American Legion's arguments were the ones that terrified me because here we've got these two new judges, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, who we know work with the Federal Society, we know their agenda is uh, anti-separation of church and state. How am I going to prevent this damage from happening? So I just, you know, I did my best to, to, to um, help work with, like, kind of work within the framework that we're going to lose and explain why the court doesn't need to reach their conclusions and you can if you uphold this it would be because it's historic or because it's um, you know it's been there for a long time or just kind of trying to cater to some of those easier arguments that we can get around for later and luckily we ended up with a very fragmented ruling um, the judges couldn't agree on a standard uh, a, a way a, a principle because how can you how can you come up with a principle that would allow the government to maintain fund display a religious symbol for only one religion. It's just there's no principled way of doing that. So you end up with seven different opinions or you know opinions by all seven justices that all wanted to uphold it for different reasons. You have Justice Breyer saying it's old, it's not that big of a deal. You have um, Gorsuch saying that we didn't even have standing to bring in the case. You have um, Kagan who sort of thinks, well, it's uniquely tied to World War One. So they don't agree on anything, which is good for us going forward. They didn't overrule the test that we that was on the table, the Lemon Test, if anyone is a lawyer or has heard of the Lemon Test. It's the analysis that's been used for decades on how to establish or how to determine a, a violation. They wanted it overruled, it's not overruled. Um, it's it's um, you know it's still applicable, but we are nervous about the effects of this case, and not only this case, but the the cases currently on the court's docket, which um, are basically whether religion can now be used as a sword um, 
against the, the, the civil rights and the human rights of others. Um, so as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, we are definitely taking a, a you know, when we filed this case, there's no way we could have foreseen the, the whole circumstance of, of Kavanaugh being confirmed. You know, Justice Kennedy had some good dicta, uh, some good language in his rulings about crosses not being allowed. And he said, well, it'd be one thing if it's a temporary nativity scene, I'm okay with that. But clearly a cross on a government building would be unconstitutional. So when Pe Kennedy was around, we were okay. Um, so this is all, you know, again, when, when these elections happen, the first thing us lawyers and these groups think of is like, oh my gosh, the courts. Because now it's not just Bladensburg, it's also my Pensacola cross case, which is in Florida. And that centers around a cross that's not a memorial. It's exclusively used for Easter sunrise services. And yet we're worried that we're going to lose that case too because we have, very, we have a Trump appointed judge on that case. We have judges that don't want us to win. And so what kind of legal gymnastics are they going to use to, to, rule, to uphold this cross? And so we're just trying to um, you know, take a pause and, and find the avenues that we can win, but not create bad precedent because precedent can last and kind of wait it out and hope that, you know, we vote for the right president next term. Uh, you know, someone that's not going to um, appoint these judges that um, hand down rulings that we're seeing right now. Um, so I guess I kind of just want to open up for questions, I guess, um, if people have any, because I don't want to just keep talking and keep people here for longer than, uh, you guys want, but if there's any questions about, you know, what it's like to argue in the Supreme Court, what it's like to be in front of Kavanaugh and have to face him and answer him, what it's like to see Ginsburg. Um, yes, all of those. All of those. Okay, let me start with Ginsburg because that's the fun one. Um, I was like surprisingly less nervous than I thought I would be. I kind of had the same like nerves but excitement that I would go into like a, a normal appellate argument where you're just kind of like, yeah, I'm ready to do this, ready to do my thing. And I'm sitting there and I have all my binders spread out. It's just me at my at the plaintiff's table and then our defendants like were on like overflow. They had like so many, you know, lawyers and they're all they had all their fancy stuff and I was just like, cool, I'm just gonna do this. And they, the judges walk in and I'm looking at, I look at Gorsuch, I'm like, whatever, Thomas, whatever. And then I see Ginsburg and she kind of like, cause she's sort of sitting back and I saw her like peer over to like look down at me and we like made eye contact. And I was like, oh my God, this is actually happening. And it was like this totally surreal moment. I had to look back at Gorsuch so I didn't get nervous and I just like drank all my water and I'm like, there's no more water left. <laughs> so that was nerve wracking. Like my heart's already like, just pounding thinking about that, especially because she's not just been like, she's recently become such an icon, but she's someone that, you know, since law school, I have been reading her dissents and her opinions, and I've had such admiration for her that it was just like, uh, you know, a law school student's dream come true. <laughs> um, with respect to Kavanaugh, that was tricky. Um, he wasn't actually like, as far as like who was on the panel that day, he was not my worst enemy. Like he was, cause I went second. And so he was actually asking them the tough questions. He's like, how does a cross represent Jews? You know, like how he was actually asking the right questions, which made me feel like I still don't think he's going to rule on my side because it's Kavanaugh, but he wasn't asking, he wasn't giving them softballs either. Um, and then his ruling was actually the, the most bizarre ruling in or his opinion in the case. I don't know if anyone has endeavored to read this very long splintered ruling, um, but Kavanaugh's dissent was like oddly, I don't even know how to characterize it, but he basically is inviting us. He said, you know, just because you've lost in the courts doesn't mean you've lost forever. He's like, you can actually go to appeal to the Maryland legislature and ask them to remove the cross. You know, the constitution is just like this, you know, one avenue, but plaintiffs go ahead and ask the Maryland legislature to have it removed. And it was like, are you inviting, like, well, whose side are you on? It was just the weirdest, like, I didn't understand his opinion. And I think it's probably because he has friends that are not Christian who he feels like they might have sided with us and he was trying to appeal to them. I don't know what it was, but it was weird. Um, I certainly felt a little like I, it was it was definitely weird to see him and it felt very surreal that like outside of the courthouse that day just like many other days before it you see those women wearing um, the robes doing the um, handmaid's tale sort of protest and so it was sort of surreal to see those people every day and then be inside the courtroom and have to argue in front of this man who a lot of people don't think should be on the bench because of his uh, his past so um, yeah, and it, yeah, just, I don't know, the, the whole arguing from the Supreme Court thing was really n exciting and interesting, but it took a lot of work because, um, you know, we're a nonprofit and we have limited resources and we're up against these 
groups, law firms, you know, Jones Day represented the government. Um, they, they had so many resources on their side and it's just like, we're the small entity. So I was, sleepless nights doesn't begin to describe like the emotional, mental, physical toll it took on me, but it was also just, you know, just such a neat experience to be like, I argued in the Supreme Court. Like, so yeah. Any other, yeah. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think because he also knew he was under the microscope and his legitimacy is in question, I think he was he was attempting to make a conservative argument, which is states' rights. I mean, that's consistent with federalism and the federal society. So he was making a states' rights argument, and he was looking for a narrow reason to to rule against us. But it was it kind of transcended that. Like it was, it'd be one thing to say, you know, the legislature can decide these issues, but it was. It was very like invitational. Like it was very much like plaintiffs go to the Maryland legislature. Maybe he just knows that we have zero chance of convincing them to remove this thing. But it was um, weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, so the question being that is the rule now or the test now that an old monument can stand? I mean, arguably that, that portion of the opinion didn't necessarily garner a majority, and insofar as it did, it actually didn't establish anything new because that was the opinion of Justice Breyer, who had done a similar thing in the Van Orden case. If anyone's familiar with the Texas uh, crash, I'm uh, sorry, not crash, the Ten Commandments in Texas, Justice Breyer said a similar thing, a 40-year-old monument, no one's challenged it for 40 years, therefore it must be secular because otherwise someone would have said something before. No one perceives this as religious. Well, there's a lot of reasons why someone in Texas wouldn't want to go marching into the court to challenge a religious display. I mean, I, I get so much backlash and sometimes death threats. It's just like, it's such a no-brainer to me, but for him, that's the logic of that. So. Um, they're, they didn't create a standard, that's why it's also very difficult to take these convoluted establishment clause cases and make sense of them. Um, for instance, in our Pensacola cross case, that cross uh, was put up in the 70s, so it's old, but it's not 100 years old. Um, and to what extent does age matter? I think, I take Breyer's reasoning to mean age matters when we don't have any other indication that maybe this is seen as religious or used as religious. So it wasn't just the age in Bladensburg, it was the fact that it was a World War I memorial, that there was no religious usage of that symbol. It had been, um, they had consistently used it for veterans events. Now the veterans events had prayers at them and that was a point I raised in all my briefs, but that was not enough to sort of transform those events into religious ceremonies. Whereas in the, in the, Bladen, in the Pensacola Cross case in Florida, it's only used for Easter sunrise services. So I would argue that the longevity doesn't secularize it when it's used exclusively for religious reasons, um, like Easter sunrise service. Yeah. Um, in what ways do you feel like the satanic temple's attempts to counter, um, uh, you know, these different statues and everything mm -hmm. at state capitals, in what ways do you feel like that might be another effective yeah. I mean, I love those guys, and um, I actually admit I haven't seen the documentary yet, but I, I work with the Satanist groups, and they're usually, I sort of see them as like a last resort kind of thing, like um, in the legislative prayer context, for instance, we know that the Supreme Court's already upheld legislative prayer, um, meaning that governments can open up city council meetings with prayer. It's a thing that we've basically lost. We're not going to get that overturned anytime soon. So what a better way to show Christians how it feels when you're ha having to sit through a prayer you don't feel comfortable in than have a Satanist come wearing, one of my clients, uh, David Suhor, 
showed up wearing like the whole black robe and he's like all hail satan and he had this whole song and it was like amazing to watch them just super squeamish like hated it and it's not because i want people to be uncomfortable and squeamish but i want them to see what it feels like to have religion you don't subscribe to thrown in your face and that was just one day you know like these these christian prayers are happening every single day um in a lot of these communities so i i think it's great you know especially in the school context we see a lot of good news club i don't know if you guys are familiar with the good news club but they do these after school kids programs so they have after school satan and parents got to see what that feels like to get a track you know in the kids backpack being like after school satan um and of course it's just nothing but like positive things it's like they're like coloring books and everything's about positive values and the satanists are not actually teaching devil worship but it's enough to make the parents be uncomfortable which is how atheist parents feel when they see the good news club sneaking into their kids school so um i think they're fantastic we actually are working with them right now in our case against um, arkansas and their ten commandments monument we kind of have it set up where it's like either you remove the monument or you get to put up their about the their basement, you know, scary goat looking scary thing. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Yeah. Good question. So really, honestly, like, and I'm not just saying this, like, there is no firm rule that comes out of that case. All you get is a, um, it was 7-2, and it is disheartening that Kagan and Breyer sided with the conservative bloc. However, it wasn't surprising, and that was given their stance in previous cases. Kagan actually had to argue in support of a cross in the other case that went up to the Supreme Court, the Mojave Desert Cross. She was tasked with arguing there is a connection between World War I and the Latin cross. So it didn't surprise me she took that side here. And then again with Breyer and his upholding a 40-year-old Ten Commandments on Texas Capitol grounds, I was like, this is probably in his eyes similar. Um, but the end result is really that at best there is a presumption of constitutionality for old displays that have some secular connection to some secular event like World War I and uh, that has not been used for religious purposes. That's probably the closest thing I could say to a test that comes out of the case. There's a long footnote in there that says um, this case doesn't touch upon school issues. It doesn't touch upon, you know, they kind of segmented off categories and what this case is not about. So that gives us um, some, some room in our future cases to say this did not touch school issues. We are still arguing our cases just as we would before Bladensburg. Um, as attorneys, we know that we have to strategize a little bit harder and, and better because even if they're saying that these other judges we go before are emboldened by these kind of rulings, they know that even if they're wrong on the law, they might not get overturned. So we have to take that into account regardless of the actual holding. Any other questions? No? Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, so unlocking the cage, everyone should see it. Um, it was really neat because they filmed us like since I was in law school until maybe like forget the the last time they filmed us but we would meet in New York me and this small group of um, of lawyers to discuss animal rights this is my other job the non-human rights project um, and it would just be like six of us in the film crew in hotel rooms and often we just would forget that they were there and it's one of those things where i watch a lot of reality tv and I, and i'm always like oh that's so staged or like like of course they know the film crew is there they're acting but you actually forget about them because they become your friends and you're you actually sometimes ask them for an advice or they're like go get you some water and they just become part of the background so um it was but yeah it was amazing and it was one of those things where they saw the progression of us from a very small kind of not think tank because we were always planning to bring these lawsuits but um to actually filing our first case and to have them be with us through that process and actually have it documented and be able to look back at where we were and where we've come is so amazing and so unique to have that um that documented experience for sure yeah, yeah. oh yeah I think if you're asking about um, taking it up to the Maryland legislature, that yes. So we actually did take Kavanaugh's cue, uh, and we are working on legislative efforts. We have Jamie Raskin is in Maryland. We have some some sympathetic um, legislatures and, and politicians over there. I don't really see what's interesting. Okay, let me back up for a second because it's kind of a funny fact that I discovered. So in lawsuits, you get discovery, meaning you get a 
ask the government for documents. Um, so after we, this is all, of course, after you sue them. So I'm going through these emails and I find that the Maryland government that was in charge of this cross did not want it. Like they were like, what's demolition by neglect? Are we allowed to just let it crumble? And they did not want to, because it just wasn't working. They kept funding it and it kept falling apart. So they were probably going to let this thing fall if we didn't sue, which is kind of crazy because like, uh, we wouldn't have known that, right? But they would be like, oh, it's like ugly. And they are, there were so many like negative comments from the inside government about this thing. But publicly, they're like, save the cross. And because they have to cater to, to their, their religious constituents. But, um, you know, I don't know what the odds are of changing. I, I, don't, I don't know how far that would go. But what I will say is that um, several schools across the country have taken our case as sort of a mock trial case either in high school middle school law school um, and one school in Maryland I want to say it was high school it could have even been younger did a mock trial on our case and they had the kids divide up and they had judges and the majority of the students would have ruled uh, in our favor against the cross and they thought it was a no-brainer and they said how does the cross represent everyone it leaves people out and they were quoted in the news and it was this fantastic thing and so maybe some of these Maryland legislators will wake up and realize young people don't want to be exclusion you know exclude other people and they want to be inclusive they want to honor separation of church and state so maybe it'd be in their best interest but I you know as a lawyer that works more on the court side of things I don't know I, I don't know as much of the ins and outs of of pushing things legislatively, but I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't know how, how well that would work, but you never know. You never know. Yeah. Exactly. It's not in the taxpayer's interest. I mean, Bladensburg has a lot of needs and putting more money into something that's doomed, basically. I mean, they, they can't figure out a way, because it's a, they, it was this exposed aggregate concrete. It's not like a normal kind of concrete they use, and a special guy created it. So I don't know, I mean, whatever. It's not my fight anymore, but I'd be happy to see it relocated. It doesn't need to come down, they could relocate it somewhere safe, um, and you know, on private property where people can actually pay their respects, because you can't cross, like I said, you can't cross this uh, intersection safely. So it's really doing no one any good being there, and it's certainly not helping the cross. So, all right, any more questions before we? Yeah, yeah. I've talked to reporters um, that have said they actually almost got hit trying to take pictures of the cross for that reason. It's dangerous for sure. All right, well, I appreciate everyone um, coming and staying till the end and happy to answer questions via email. It's at mmiller at americanhumanist.org.